The hero genre has been booming these past few years, especially with the release of Endgame and a whole lineup of new superhero movies and series being released in the next three years. Now, I love superhero movies and what I probably love almost equal to that are short films. So when my girlfriend told me about this movie on Netflix called Modest Heroes, which is three short films compiled together, each telling their own unique story, I had to check it out. But what really made me curious about this movie is the title. Modest heroes. Modest meaning unassuming in the estimation of one's abilities or achievements, and hero meaning a person who is admired for their courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities. This contrast and definition stood out to me as I watched all three short films in succession. But I also noticed something else, something a lot of short films do, which I was certainly excited to see. That being show, don't tell. Now I'm sure everyone's English teacher has told you that when doing creative writing, but the guideline of show, don't tell really shows itself when animated. This video is basically a love letter to Modest Heroes, and I highly suggest you find some way to watch it before continuing watching this video. So, without further ado, let's explore the three stories of Modest Heroes and its beautiful visual storytelling. Canini and Canino is the first of the three short films, and it gives off an Arietti kind of vibe. If you haven't seen The Secret World of Arietti, one, what are you doing watching an analysis video when you could be watching another one of Studio Ghibli's masterpieces? And two, both films follow the life and struggles of tiny people living in our comparatively big and dangerous world. Brother and sister, Kanini and Kanino, and their father live together underwater in a small river. Their father teaches them some basics on how to survive, and all seems pretty well, until their father is swept away on a bubble while trying to protect the two children. Now, up to this point, and for the rest of the film, the only dialogue that is spoken from any character is Kanini, Kanino, Tata, meaning father, and Kaka, meaning mother. And that's arguably all that needs to be said, because the narrative is conveyed perfectly through its gorgeous visuals backed up by its soundtrack. An example of this is near the beginning, when a school of fish swim high above the three family members, just after they themselves finished hunting smaller fish. The slow moving shadows and less than joyful music conveys the idea that bigger fish eat smaller fish and that these three characters are certainly not the biggest fish in the river, which foreshadows what is to come. Kanini and Kanino decide to find and save their lost father. It's the classic film trope you see in a lot of anime. Kids or young adults having to fight and learn on their own to achieve a goal. In The Promised Neverland, the children must learn to adapt, plan, and improvise their way through intimidating and overwhelming situations. And in Maiden Abyss, probably the most similar, where the two children, Rico and Reg, head down into the abyss in search for Rico's mother. As you can tell, this trope is used a lot, but for me personally, it doesn't make watching all these characters strive for their goals any less entertaining and emotional, but I digress. The film begins to protrude a darker and bleaker aesthetic these kids struggle through as they search for their father. The two children eventually find their father, and I'll say it again, with practically no dialogue. An intense encounter with a big fish in shoes, foreshadowed early in the film, but before being consumed whole, the fish is eaten and swallowed whole by a bigger and more feathery predator. Kenini, Kenino, and their father arrive back home with their mother floating down from the surface after giving birth on land. An adorable and emotional reunion ensues and the film ends there. Life Ain't Gonna Lose. Not the best title in my opinion, but hey, it's one of those more heart-wrenching stories being told here, so I'll give it a pass. Now, unlike Kanini and Kanino, this story has a lot more dialogue, but that doesn't sway the quality of its visual interpretation of suspense and desperation in the slightest. In Life Ain't Gonna Lose, we follow a young boy who is severely allergic to eggs and his mother who tries everything in her power to protect him from harm's way. Now, if you haven't noticed, each short film uses its own unique art style. 
Kanini and Kanino go for that Arietti kind of vibe, whereas I find this one is more similar to an extremely soft version of Ponyo, and that works in its favor. In the first few minutes, we're introduced to the struggles a mother has to go through when looking after her son and protecting him from his deadly egg allergy. The beginning of the short shows incidents where he accidentally consumes something with egg in it and how it can lead to him almost dying if not treated immediately. Now there are two scenes in particular which convey suspense and desperation. About halfway through the film, the son is taken to his mother's dance competition to watch her performance. We watch the group dance and the animation becomes more fluid-like, what I'd like to perceive as everyone kind of letting go of all their problems and just enjoying and living in the moment. But not for long, cause damn those are some tasty cookies and this son is too busy being entranced by the power of dance as he mindlessly grabs a choc chick cookie and goes to eat it, but luckily his mother manages to stop him just in time, but that ruins her performance. Those few moments of pure freedom the mother and the son have feel great, but it's taken away so quickly we barely got time to relax and enjoy it. Just like the mother, she's always having to worry about her son accidentally hurting himself. But what about desperation? Sure, we've seen these characters being desperate, but in one of the last scenes of the film, that pure, desperate feeling, that urge to survive, is visualized amazingly. Let me explain. The son is chilling at home, alone, after some baseball, and decides to treat himself to some egg-free ice cream. He puts a scoop in his mouth, but realizes something is wrong. Reading the back of the label, it contains eggs. He calls his mother who had no idea she had bought the wrong ice cream and tells him to quickly go to their neighbor so they can inject him with his epinephrine pen. As he runs down the stairs, the lines and colors unsettle and his allergic reaction begins to flare up. The vibration of colors and unsecure outlines of the boy emit this feeling of desperation as he fights the pain in order to get help. And thankfully he does. I don't believe Life Ain't Gonna Lose was meant to prioritize a sense of suspense and desperation. It lands more in the realm of the struggles and hardships a mother and son have to live through when death is always just on the other side of the door. Overall, Life Ain't Gonna Lose portrays its intense scenes in uniquely animated ways, which amplifies the weight of the suspenseful and desperate situation throughout, which I believe immerses us into its story extremely well. Have you ever felt no one could see you or hear you? No matter what nice thing you did for a passing stranger, no matter how much you yearned for help, none seemed to come. That feeling is shown in the third and final short film of Modest Heroes, fittingly titled Invisible. Invisible is about a man who is invisible, not only physically, but socially as well. The short throws us straight in with the man getting ready for work, while keeping his foot underneath a weight. When leaving his house, he carries around an extinguisher. The metaphorical and actual reason for this is revealed shortly after, because arriving at his work and doing his job, it's without a doubt that no one can see him or hear him or really sense his presence at all. Later after work, he goes to a gas station and while trying to take money out of his bank account, it's apparent he's not only invisible, but physically lighter than air. Therefore, he floats. The man continues to attempt to interact with people, but with no success. And it's obvious that him being in this constant state of not being noticed or interacted with by others has made him depressed and void of all hope. That's where I feel the weights he uses to keep him from floating away is a metaphor for all the things weighing him down emotionally. Honestly, what makes this short film even more impressive than it already is, is that the creators managed to visually storytell the everyday life struggles and more through a character who's invisible with no understanding facial emotion. I honestly love it so much. But digressing from the love I have for this short, the man becomes angry and hopeless and throws away the weight keeping him down, choosing to just let it all go. However, just like with a helium balloon, he begins to float up into the atmosphere. The man metaphorically and literally lets go, but quickly realizes as much as he wants to let go of everything and just be done with it, he doesn't really want to go. 
A storm rages on as he struggles to grab hold of something secure, the storm being the end of it all for him. Now, you could call it a glimmer of hope, or you could simply call it a survival instinct. It can be up to your interpretation, honestly. But he manages to make his way back down to the ground, safe, but completely lost on what to do. He doesn't want to die, but he also doesn't want to live in this cruel and forgiving life. The Invisible Man sits in the rain, using a pickaxe as an anchor, devoid of hope, until a dog licks him on the cheek. Looking up, he sees a man standing next to the dog. Shocked, he asks, if the man can see him, but at a closer glance, the dog which just licked him is a walker dog. The man is blind. Yet even though the man can't see him, unlike everyone else, he can still feel the invisible man's presence, evident when he responds, yes, I can see you very clearly. Even without a visible face, it is clear the invisible man is happy and even grateful when the man offers him some food, which the invisible man previously couldn't purchase at the gas station. The last few moments of the film climaxes as a baby in a stroller rolls downhill into oncoming traffic. But thankfully, the invisible man saves the baby. And just when you think, damn, this scene came out of nowhere, what's the point of this? Well, as the baby cries safely in the invisible man's arms, he tries to cheer it up with some classic peekaboo, and the baby looks at him, smiling and laughing. It seems that the baby can see him, or at least sense his presence like the man beforehand. I feel it necessary not to go too in-depth with that last film. Yes, it can be analysed. I mean, I just analysed it. But it has that thing where different people can take different meanings out of the story, especially the ending of it, and I like that. I highly recommend you go watch this movie yourself, and I'm pretty sure you can tell that I love these three short films. The last one especially. Oh, and just to remind you that I usually stream on Twitch around three times a week. Stream times varying from week to week though. I'd also like to thank Nadette and Scarf Gaming for your support over on Patreon. Anyways, I really hope you enjoy the video and have a good one.